the webinar. Um, my name is Holly Bonar, and I am a clinical application specialist with DeNovo Software. Um, before I came to the company, I had um, quite a few years of experience in the clinical lab, and um, my favorite thing is to talk about um, clinical features of the software and how clinical labs can use those features to enhance their layouts and their data analyses. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, just a few housekeeping rules before we get started. Um, we want to make sure everything goes smoothly. So if you haven't already and you can hear me and see my screen, please say hello in the question box of the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, feel free to put questions in that box as we go along. My colleague Robin Kamacheka is also on the webinar and she'll be answering those questions in real time as we go. Um, we'll also be happy to show you any features or do any more, um, more in-depth details of the things I'm going to show you today um, at the end of the webinar. So feel free to put those questions in there as we go. Um, as I said, we're also recording this webinar and it should be available on our website and on our YouTube page um, in a few days. So be sure to look with that or to share it with anybody else who you know who wasn't able to attend today. All right, so we're going to get started. And today we're going to be talking all about quality in FCS Express 7. And so FCS Express has a lot of features that are built directly in the software to give you the tools that you need to achieve those quality results that your clinical lab wants to produce. And so today I'm going to show you how you can add on some of these features and kind of how they work and then show you kind of what the possibilities are because we're going to have a layout that we're going to work with the entire time that we're talking and we'll show you how all those features kind of come together um, to really um, improve your layouts and your QC that you're doing in your lab. Okay. So some of these features are available as additional add-on features that are kind of designed to help you meet 21 CFR Part 11 compliance um, of the FDA regulations for medical devices. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but those features include our security, which is both user and layer layout based, um, audit trails, where you can um, keep track of everything you're doing in your layouts, um, as well as electronic signatures. And then we also have an IQ OQ package that you can add on as a part of your validation process. Um, we also have some features that are used specifically and designed for our clinical customers. And so these kinds of tools can be added to your analysis to kind of help make your reports more thorough um, with interpretations and qualitative assessments of your flow data. Um, and then I want to show you some examples of how you can use FCS Express IVD, not just for patient data analysis, but for QC functions in your lab. So things like individual lot to lot checks, antibody lot checks, um, Levy Jennings to monitor performance over time, things like linearity or antibody titration. So these are all things that you're probably doing in your lab that aren't necessarily patient data driven, um, but they're how you um, do the QC functions in your lab and you can incorporate FCS Express into your workflow for those. So I have some examples of that um, that I'm going to show. So what is 21 CFR Part 11 compliance? And, how, and what does that mean for a clinical laboratory environment? Um, so FCS Express IVD is listed with the FDA um, as a medical device. And it's subject to all of the federal regulations that pertain to that class of devices. Um, so if you aren't familiar with it um, specifically, all of those regulations that are involved with medical devices is listed in 21 CFR Part 11 of those FDA rules, right? And so you can read more about those specific regulations on our website. We have a whole list of what those regulations are and what we've done with the software to specifically address um, those requirements. Um, and you can go through that and see exactly how um, FCS IVD can meet 21 CFR Part 11. But there are some general um, requirements um, that are encompassed in 21 CFR Part 11. And these are similar to the types of things that you might currently already be doing in your own lab to maintain compliance, right? So we do documentation and testing at all phases of development of the software. So we do quite a bit of in-house testing with the IVD version prior to the release of any version. Um, we perform over 500 individual test cases and we document every one of them every single one of those test cases must pass before we will release a new version. Um, all of the calculations 
that are performing the software are checked and validated to make sure that they're correct. And we have documentation of all of that every time we release a new version. If there are any bugs that are found in the software, or if there is anything that doesn't turn up exactly right, um, we do do, a, we have strict, we have strict procedures for documentations of those bugs and what the things that we do to address it. Um, we keep our customers up to date on the status of those issues um, and we make sure that we get out a fix for that as soon as possible if it's deemed to be critical. So if you find while you're using the software, you find anything that looks like it might be a bug or it looks like it's not calculating correctly, definitely bring those to our attention sooner rather than later. You can always send us an email at support at denovosoftware.com. Um, even if you're not sure about what it is, you can always just say, hey, I'm seeing something fishy here. I'm not sure what it is. Um, we really want to stay on top of those bugs so we can make sure that we get them taken care of. Okay. And then we do quite a bit of internal and external reviews of our software development process. So we review all of our quality procedures and policies in a scheduled and periodic manner. Um, any changes to any of our procedures since our last review um, are reevaluated just to, for quality assurance purposes. And we're audited every year by an independent group um, who does who comes in and does a review of our documentation and our quality procedures. And then we can also be inspected by the FDA at any time anytime they want to perform their own audit. Um, so we have all of these, you know, um, intensive ways that we make sure that the quality of our FCS Express IVD software um, is the best that it can be. And as I mentioned, oops, and as I mentioned, there's a couple of add-ons that are additional features that kind of help you achieve that final full 21 CFR Part 11 compliance. And this includes the security, um, the security package with our electronic signatures, that logging and audit trail. And I'm going to talk about these in a few um, in the next uh, section. Um, but then we also have this IQ, IQOQ document. And this is a separate thing that you can purchase to add to your validation of the software in your laboratory. Um, and it's a pretty intensive document that um, gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to check every single thing that the software does. And it helps you show that the installation and performance of FCS Express IVD is functioning as expected in your location. Um, so we provide all of these documents to you. We provide all the layouts and the data. And then somebody can sit down in your laboratory, go through them step-by-step, -step, and document that you are achieving the expected result. And then this becomes another piece of documentation that you can add to your portfolio of validation for everything that's going on in your lab. Okay. So let's talk about security and logging and what that looks like in FCS IVD. So I'm just going to go through an overview um, of what these uh, things are, and then we'll open up the software and kind of show you how it all works within a clinical layout. Okay, so for security, the security feature consists of both user based security and layout based security. So, what does that mean? So, for user based security, it means that every security user has their own unique login and password combination. And so, a security user is anyone who wants access to the, to the software. And this can be anyone from a technician who's doing the first analysis of a set of patient data, a supervisor who's maybe doing secondary review of what the first tech did, um, a hematopathologist who is ultimately signing out the case, or even just an administrator who's just maintaining the license and making sure all the users um, are able to log in and perform their task, right? And so you can have several different types of users depending on how you want to organize it in your lab. You can have every single person who's going to access the software have their own unique password and login so they can log in with their name. Um, or you can just have individual groups of people log in in a generic way. So like anybody who's going to be a tech or function as a tech would just log in with tech and the tech user. Just depends on what works for your lab. And with your security users, you can then create security groups. And so security groups are generalized groups of people who may need different permissions in order to do certain tasks in the software. Um, so it's going to allow you to define those permissions for each user and allow you to create different levels of access. And layout-based security is a little bit similar, but it's specific to a layout. So it's going to allow you to define the functionality and the permissions within a layout. Um, and it's going to narrow down the permissions 
of a user within a specific layout. So let's say, for example, that in general, technicians in your laboratory are allowed to move plots on a layout. Um, but in one case, you have a specific QC layout that you want to lock down completely and you don't want gates to be moved. So you can change the layout security options for that one specific layout so no one can delete, move a gate or delete the plot, even if they normally would be able to. Um, Layout-based security will supersede user security, and so both must allow for a task to be performed. So if you're allowed to delete gates, you must be given that permission as a user, but you must also be allowed to do it within the layout before the permission will be granted. Okay. And then within security, we have the ability to add electronic signatures. So this is going to allow, it's going to work with those security features, and it's going to allow you to record timestamps for when the analysis is reviewed or when it's ready to be signed off. And then finally, for, oops, and finally for audit trails, you're gonna have the ability to keep track of every change that's made to a layout from the time it's open to the time it's saved again. And so this includes things like moving a gate, changing quadrants, electronically signing on a layout. Anytime you're making sort of a change, it's gonna document what that change is, it's gonna document document which user has made the change, the date, and the time. And when you go in and look at these timestamps, you're gonna see um, some pretty detailed information about what was actually done. If you've moved a gate, it's gonna tell you what dot plot you moved it on, where it was moved to, and what was changed. And this can be really helpful if down the line you see something weird going on with some analysis, you can go back and check the audit trail to see exactly what was changed on what day um, and by who. Okay. So let's go ahead and go into the software um, and kind of see what this looks like um, as you would be using it in your lab. So I'm going to go ahead and launch FCS Express 7 IVD. And I'm using security and logging with um, this particular license. So the first thing it's going to pop up, you can see here, is a place to log in. And I'm just going to log in right now as the admin. So every license that comes with security is going to have at least one person who acts as the administrator. And generally, they have permissions to do all of the things that you might want to do in the lab or in, within the software. Okay. And for now, I'm just going to start with a blank layout because I want to go in and take a look at these security settings and see how they work. Okay. So to get to security settings, um, we're going to go to the top of our um, toolbars here and go to File and choose security. And you'll see that we have a number of different um, setting options that we can work with. Um, at the top is user administration. So this is where you're gonna add any users to your license and you're going to um, give them a password and a username and you can add them to a security group from here, okay? Um, here you can edit your security configuration. So this is where you can determine how many times you can log in to the software or how, what your, how long your password is good for, things like that. Um, layout status definitions, it'll say what sort of restrictions your particular layout might have, I mean, what actions might be performed while you're do in those different states. Um, and then we have our security group definitions. So here's where you're gonna create those security groups and determine what each of those groups are gonna be able to do and not do, okay? So I would actually recommend starting, if you're starting with security features for the first time, um, actually starting with security group definitions. So first think about, you know, what are the types of people you have in your lab? What are the types of tasks you want each of those groups are, to be able to do? And define those first. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and click that. And you'll see our window pops up. It has a list of the security group definitions. So I've already got some created here. Um, we're always gonna have an administrator. Again, this is the person that um, is gonna administer your license and be able to access all of the features and things and do all of the tasks, okay? Um, this person, this group, you can't get rid of. You'll see that it's here and we can't delete it. Um, I've gone ahead and added three different groups that are, are pretty common for clinical laboratories. Um, I simply come in here and click the add button and then I can name it and choose what they, um, they can do. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on our tech only group and I'll choose modify just so we can go in and see what it looks like. Um, this is what the window would look up would look like if you click add. Um, so I've called it tech only. And you can see here 
with this scroll bar that there's quite a few uh, tasks that you can choose to give permissions for for any given security. And if you start to open these up, you'll see that there's quite a few things in here that you can turn on or off. And it's going to be really important that you kind of think, you know, crit critically about um, what you want these groups to do and what permissions they can or can't do. Um, the first thing you'll need to decide is whether you're going to check things to allow people to do stuff or whether you're going to check things to not allow people to do stuff. So for example, here I have include all permissions checked below. If I check this item, that means anything I'm checkbox here is going to be what they're allowed to do. So in general, if you check this one, it means they're not allowed to do most things, but you're going to come in and give them permission to do certain things, and I'm going to check those. The other option is to include all permissions except those checked below. So let's say for your particular security group, you want them to be able to do most things, but there's a few things you don't want them to do. So in that case, this option would be a little bit easier, and that way you can just check off the things you don't want them to do. So for our tech-only group today, um, I'm giving them permission to do all of the things with the exception of removing a gate. So you can see here I've opened this up. I've checked remove a gate. So they'll be able to do everything in the software except for remove a gate, okay? And I've done that with each of my different groups. If I go in and check the settings, you'll see that I've given them permission to do certain things. And if you find that you're using security options in the software and you see that some people are getting errors saying that they don't have permission for things um, and you feel like that's not supposed to happen, come into your security group definitions and check out what's checked and what's unchecked. So a lot of times something is checked or unchecked um, that you didn't realize it and it's blocked somebody from doing something, okay? So now that we have our security groups, I'm gonna close this. And now I'm gonna go back to security and add some people, right? So if I click my user administration, you'll see that I have a list of users here. Again, we have our administrator who can do all of the things. Uh, and then I've added some people on here. So uh, my colleague, Robin, who's on the webinar with us today, let's go in and check. I added her by simply clicking add, um, but we're gonna come in and edit and see what her window looks like. So I've given her a login name, I've given her a password and filled in like the demographic information. Um, I've given her permission to log in, I've allowed her to log out. And then you can see here that I've added her to my tech only group today. So Robin's gonna be our tech for our webinar today as we go through our clinical layouts. Um, and I could have made her, I could have added her to other security groups as well. So you don't have to just pick one. If you have a supervisor who's gonna act as a tech on some days, but a supervisor on other days, you can certainly add that person to multiple groups and then they can do the permissions that are given for each of those groups. So we've got Robin situated as a tech. We're gonna hit okay. And then I've got myself in here. If we open up um, my user, you can see that I've made myself a supervisor for the day. So I will have all the permissions of a supervisor. And then we have um, our other Denovo software colleague, Sean Burke, who will be acting as our pathologist for the day. So we've kind of got a setup here now, similar to what might be in your lab. We've got a tech we've got a supervisor and then we've got a pathologist, okay? So we've got our users. And now that we've got our users set up and our user groups set up, those people can log in and out of the software now. So if you're already in the software, um, you can log out by coming down here, clicking this button, choosing log out current user, and then log in as another user if you want. Or you can close out of the software entirely to log in as somebody else. So that's what we're gonna do. So let's open up one of our clinical templates. And this is gonna be just a TV and NK um, layout that we've built that's probably very similar to something you may have seen in your lab. So we're just simply looking at um, TV and NK populations. We've added some beads so we could do some absolute counts. Okay. And I'm gonna log out as admin and we're gonna kind of start the way we might normally start in the lab and where the tech has gone and done some um, flow and now they're gonna analyze the data. So I'm gonna log in as Robin. Okay. And so our um, 
layout, our blank layout pops up. We can see that Robin is logged in. Um, I'm going to go to file and we'll open our TDN8K blank layout and here we go. And so um, let me just take a few minutes to kind of explain how this template works. Um, at the top, we've got our logo and our title of our analysis. We've inserted a demographics um, table here that's going to pull in keyword data from our data files. So they all say error now because we haven't loaded any data here. Um, I've also inserted an electronic signature table, which I'll show you how to do here in a second, um, which this is going to document each person that comes in and reviews or does something with the analysis, and they're going to do their part and then sign off on that. We have all of our plots where the data is going to load, and then we have some statistics um that we're going to generate and report out for our patient okay <clears throat> so let me go ahead and load some data as our tech would normally do okay so our data file loads you see everything populates quite nicely we've got our patient data up here we've got our our plots here and our statistics down Okay, and so I mentioned that I inserted this electronic signatures table here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how electronic signatures are created and how we can insert them into our layout um, for documentation purposes. Right. So electronic signal signatures are specific for each layout. So you do have to add them to each individual layout. However, you can create them once, and if you're gonna use the same signatures for all the layouts in your laboratory, you can save them and then just import them in to subsequent layouts. So you're not having to rebuild them. So to get to that list of electronic signatures, we can go to File and then Info. And then here we've got a button that says Electronic Signatures. So when I click this, I'm gonna have the option to sign, unsign, or view the signature list. So we're gonna look at that first. And this is where you would come to add signatures to your layout. And I've already added a couple of them here. Um, but you would simply come to this window, choose add, and you'd get a new signature. And then you could rename it, choose who the signatures are for and whether they're allowed to sign or unsign. Okay, so I'm gonna delete this new one. And, and so let's kind of take a look at these ones that I've already created. So we're gonna need a signature for all of the groups of people that are potentially gonna sign our document. And again, this can be customized to the workflow that you're doing in your lab, whether you want all of the different groups of people to sign or whether you just want the pathologist to ultimately sign off on it. You can do as many or as few as you would like. Um, so for here, we've created a signature for all three of our groups. Um, first person who's gonna sign off on it is the flow tech. So they're the person who's gonna do the original analysis. So I've added it, I call it flow tech. Um, we're going to allow this signature for only those people who are in the tech only group, which makes sense. You can only sign electronically sign something as a flow tech if you are in the tech only group. Um, and then we've chosen to allow signing. So they're going to be able to sign this um, no matter what. Um, and we've actually allowed them to unsign. And you can turn this off. You can set it so that once somebody has electronically signed it, they cannot unsign it. Okay. For our second reviewer, so this will be like for our supervisory review, we've made it so that that applies to the supervisory group only. And for this one, we've made it so that we can only sign with this signature if the previous flow tech has signed off on it, right? So we wouldn't want a supervisor to sign off on something unless the flow tech has signed off on it first. So unless that token is, is um, there, uh, they're not gonna be able to sign. And then finally, we've kind of done the same for the pathologist. We've added that signature for the pathologist only group. Um, and then the second reviewer needs to sign before the pathologist can sign. And so setting up your signatures in this way can sort of make sure that you're following the workflow that you want to follow in your labs. The tech signs first, then the reviewer, then the pathologist, okay? Now, once you have these signatures created, you can save them. So if I click Save here, I can save this as a signatures file. Um, we'll just call it lab signatures. And then in your subsequent layouts, you can come to this electronic signatures list and choose load. And so choosing that signature file will keep you from having to add them all individually again. You click load, 
all of these will pop back up and you can add those to each of your layouts. And we'll click OK. So now we've got signatures built for our layout. And so let's kind of go through what a workflow might look like if you were had these groups in your lab and you were using this as analysis. So our tech, Robin, has come in. She's opened this link layout and she's loaded some data. Now, She's gonna come in, make sure all of this information is correct. Um, she probably will wanna come in, move some gates around to wherever she feels appropriate. And so if you remember in our security group definitions, we turned off the task, the permissions for Robin to be able to delete a gate. Um, we've given her permission to move it, um, which is fine, um, because she's gonna need to come in here and move these gates around to where they need to be. Um, but we don't, want her, we don't want her deleting gates, because that's gonna, you know, mess up our tokens, mess up our calculations here. Um, and now if she tries to delete a gate, so I'm gonna highlight this gate, I'm gonna hit delete on my keyboard, you'll see that this error immediately pops up and says this operation is not allowed for the current user, you do not have permission to remove a gate. So again, if you have people in your lab who are trying to do things in a layout and they find that they're getting this error and you feel like that's not supposed to be happening, check out those security group definitions, make sure that the right ones are checked and unchecked. And there are quite a few in there um, that could be um, causing a block, okay? So she can't delete anything, but she can certainly come here and move everything around. You can take a look at the data. Um, we'll go over some other things that we've inserted into this template later in the webinar. Um, but for now, she's gonna electronically sign that. And to document that, we've inserted this box here, which is a signature table. Um, so every single one of these um, options in here is a token, is a signature, electronic signature token. Um, now you can add them individually. So if I wanted to add any of these tokens individually somewhere in my layout, I could simply go to insert and choose a text box, right click, insert a token. And if you go to the signature file, you'll see that there's a number of different statistics that you can add here and put anywhere in your layout, just as you would any other token, okay? But the other nice thing about this table is that if you right click and choose insert, and you can go straight to insert a signature table. And when I do that, it's gonna automatically build this table for you. So you don't have to, if you know you're gonna insert all of these things into your layout, you don't have to do them one by one. You can simply insert a table and then format it to look however you want. Um, you can also use these tokens and pull them out and insert them anywhere in your layout. So you're just really easy to um, insert one of these tables into your layouts. Okay, so Robin has analyzed her data and now she's gonna electronically sign it. Um, so to do that, we're gonna go to file, info, back to our electronic signatures box and choose sign, okay? So it's gonna give the option of, of whatever signatures that have been assigned to her group. Um, so we've only given her the ability to use the flow text signature. She can put notes in here as we go along, as she goes along, if there's something she wants to document before she signs off on something, if she has reservations or just notes she wants to take, you can put them in here and then she'll click sign. It's going to ask for her username and password again. And then once she does that, the document will be signed by her. So here it says now that the flow tech has signed it, um, this is the person who did the signing. It was done on this day at this time, okay? And then we have it set up so she's gonna run batch actions. And if we take a real quick look at our batch actions, um, we'll see that we have a number of different ones for each of our different groups. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we've set these up um, a little bit later. Um, but know for now that um, Robin, as the person in the tech only security group, the only tech, the only options that are gonna run during the batch is the save layout that's in the tech actions folder. Um, everything else is turned off because she's neither a reviewer or an or a pathologist, okay? So when she hits run, the batch is gonna run, it's gonna save the layout, and it turns out that it's gonna save it, oops, you can look at our folder, it's gonna save it into a folder that says ready for supervisor review. And so now we have a new document, it's the version that she has that has now been analyzed by the tech and it'll have her electronic signature. So she's done for the day, she can close this layout, and then the supervisor can come in, see that she has something to analyze, to review, and come in and open this layout. 
So as the supervisor, I will log now log into the software. Oops. Call up my reviewed analysis. Okay. And we'll see that I'm now looking at the analysis that Robin has done. We see her signature. And then I can come here, move things around if I need to, uh, make whatever changes I need to as the reviewer. And then when I'm done, I'm going to now come in and put in my, electric, my electronic signature. So I could do this either by going to File and in Info again and Sign. Or if I wanted to make, if I was going to be doing lots of signatures as a course of my workflow, I could certainly add this to um, one of my ribbon bars, similar to the way you would in Office and then that will make it handy for me to get to. So if I wanna sign this, I can simply click the sign button. The second review signature is the option available to me as the supervisor. I'm gonna choose sign. And now I have, as the second reviewer has, uh, have electronically signed it, um, I am the person who did it and this was the date and time that we did it. Now I can run my batch actions. And if we take a look at the batch, You'll see now that the reviewer actions are the ones that are available to me um, since I am not the tech or the pathologist. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and run that batch. It is also just going to save a layout and I can close for the day. And then if we look in our folder structure, you can see that we now have an analysis that has been second reviewed and is now ready for our pathologist. Okay. Oops. So now I'm going to log out as the reviewer. I'm going to log in as our pathologist of the day. And I can come in, open that layout. And you'll see now I have the second reviewed version of this layout. So we've got both of our signatures here. As the pathologist, again, I can make the chain, any changes that I want to here. And when I'm ready for it to be its final version and do the final sign off as the pathologist, um, I can go ahead and sign that. This pathologist signature is what is available to me. Okay. And now you see that we have all three groups signed. When I go to batch actions, you'll see that the pathologist actions are the ones available to me as a pathologist. And for this one, since it's a final version of this layout, we're going to save the final version. We're going to export it to PDF, and then we're going to create export some statistics to the to an Excel spreadsheet, uh, which is just going to we're going to use for you know quality assurance purposes for QA purposes in our lab to kind of keep a running total of um, reportables that we're reporting out for this test. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and hit run. It's going to run through all the batches, and you'll see that our PDF is created. If we go back to our file structure and we check out this patient final version, you'll see that we have a folder filled with layouts and there's our final version of our layouts. Here is our PDF that we've saved. And then here's our Excel spreadsheet. And if we open that up, you'll see that we've exported all of this data from our uh, patient layout. And so we can continue to do that over time as a part of our QC practices. And so that's how electronic signatures and those security groups um, can kind of um, work with you, with your the QA um, systems in your laboratory. And so now that we've got this final version that's had some stuff done to it, um, we can come in and check out the logging feature. So if we go in a layout, if we go to File and then Info and View Layout History, this is where we can see all of the things that have been done by anybody who's done things in the tech, in the layout. So you can see here at the beginning of this layout, um, our tech Robin came in and she added files. Um, she moved a gate. And if you click on any one of these, it's gonna tell you who did it, the date and the time that it was done. And if you look down here, you're gonna see information about exactly what was done. So when we say we moved a gate, we moved it from this, this coordinate to this coordinate within the plot. When we resize something, um, this is exactly what we've resized. And if you go all the way down, you can see this is where Robin did her stuff as a tech. 
This is where I came in as the second reviewer. And then this is where our pathologist came in and made changes. So all of those changes have been documented and will follow along with the layout throughout the life of the layout. It can be really helpful to be able to come back to this. You also have the ability to print if you want to, print out a copy for documentation purposes. You can also save this as a PDF if you want to stay documented electronically. Um, and you can clear it at any time um, if you want to start with a brand new layout or whatever. Um, I would just highly recommend that if you're going to clear it, then make sure that you save it somewhere for documentation. Okay, so that's sort of how the security and logging can really help out with um, the quality assurance that you're doing in your lab with your layouts. Okay, let's close this. Right. So now let's talk about some clinical features in, IC, I, in FCS Express IVD. And so these are features that are um, included specifically in this version of the software. Um, and they're really geared towards providing tools for our clinical customers to kind of help you build reports for reporting out all the different types of patient and QC results. And so these features really kind of help you take your layouts to the next level in terms of just you know, creating reports that convey the results that you're trying to report out for your patients um, to really get, a, to get across both the quantitative and the qualitative results. Um, it's gonna help create aesthetically pleasing reports that are nice to look at and that are easy to understand. Um, not everybody can understand dot plots and flow cytometry data. So you have to take that data and distill it into a message that gets across what you're trying to say, okay? And it's really gonna help you fill in the gaps in the quality control process. So you can hopefully catch errors before they happen, um, or at most, or at best, you know, prevent them from happening before they reach the patient, right? You wanna be able to catch things um, before it causes problems. Um, so I'm gonna go through really quickly what these features are, and then we'll go back to our clinical layout and I'll show you how we've incorporated them into our workflow, okay? So one group of features are statistic classifier tokens or using conditional criteria. So really what it's doing is looking at a result in your analysis and then changing it in some way to um, let somebody know what it might mean. So a statistic classifier is a way to add an assessment to a statistic. So for example, if you have a lymphocyte population that is 20%, but you wanna call that high or low, based on a range of values that you've determined are normal, or you wanna say something is in range or out of range, or if you wanna say the QC passed or the QC failed, those are all classifiers. Um, you're, taking a you're taking a statistic and you're putting it into some sort of category. Um, you can add those separately into your layout. Um, you can also change the font formatting based on those same criteria. So if your percent lymphocytes is out of range, you can have it turn bright red, or if it's normal, you can have it turn green, okay? You can also use conditional criteria to turn things on and off. So when in our previous layout, we had different people logging in, um, we had our, in our batch processing, we had boxes that were checked and unchecked based on whether our user was a tech or a reviewer or a pathologist. Um, and you can also use the same criteria to turn pages on and off. So if there's a page I wanna show only if um, a percentage is a certain percentage, then we can do that, okay? The other two options, other two features that you can add are canned comments. So if you're constantly typing the same text into a layout over and over, you can have a list of canned comments that are already pre-typed and then you can drag those right, right into your layout. And then finally, you can have a list of alerts. And so this is gonna be some, this is gonna give you notification that certain statistics are outside of acceptable ranges. So if you have a list of statistics in a layout that you're always wanting to check before you finish your layout, um, you can have it run through the alerts, check those statistics for you and notify you if they're in or out. And then I do have listed my one, what I call a non-IVD trick because it's not specific to the IVD software, it's actually in the, UR, the RUO software as well. Um, but you can use custom tokens uh, in order to generate things for quality control purposes. So I like to use, one of my favorite things to do is to use if then else statements. Um, so here's an example down here and I'll show you in one of our example templates in just a minute. 
So you can build a token that tells you whether your QC passed. And so for our if then else statement, we're simply saying that if my population difference passes and if my MFI difference passes, then the whole QC passes. Else, if one of these don't pass, doesn't pass, then the whole thing fails. And so you can build these into your layouts and I'll show you kind of what those look like in our example template coming up. Okay, so let's go back and open our layout again. And I'll show you how we've incorporated some of these into this layout. So we'll go ahead and we'll log in as Robin. Robin's very busy today. Okay, so let's open our TV and K layout and we'll load a data file real quick. Okay, so we see we've got our data loaded and we've got everything here. So one of the things I talked about was a statistic classifier. And so it allows us to add an assessment to a statistic. So if we come down here, you see we've calculated our um, dated percentages of our limps of all of these populations. We've also calculated our absolute numbers. Um, we've also calculated some custom statistics. So one is the percent um, of our T lymph sum. That number needs to be less than 10%. And then we've also calculated our lymph sum, which is the sum of all the populations in the lymphocyte group. Um, and that needs to be between 95 and 105%, right? So these are the raw statistics of those calculations. So we have about six and a half percent and we have 81% here. Um, but what, how can we classify those? So if you see here, less than 10% is where we want this number to be. Um, so we've added a statistic classifier here to tell us whether this number is acceptable or not. So it's super easy to add a statistic classifier. I'm going to right click wherever I want, choose insert token, and you'll see this option here, statistic classifier. If I click that, it's gonna give me the option to do a classification. So we enter the value that we wanna classify. So here's our token. If we've done a custom token, we can come down here, choose that, and then we can add our classifications. And so for this one, we want this particular token to say acceptable if the value is between zero and 10. And then if it's anything other than 10, we're gonna say, um, unacceptable. Okay, and then we would hit OK here, right? And so that's what this particular token is. If I double click this, you'll see that we've added these actually, or for the alternative, I said out of range high, right? And then for the statistic classifier for this one, we've done the same thing. So if we look at the classification, we are classifying our lymphosome. We've added two here. Um, 95 to 105 is acceptable because that's our defined criteria. Um, anything that's from zero to 95 is gonna stay out of range low. All right, and so now these tokens are just like any other token in the layout. When I move the gates around, they're gonna update in real time. So you can see that as those numbers change, they will change. As I adjust this and pull it in, you'll see that now my lymph sum and my T lymph sum have become acceptable. So in a similar way, we can do a font classification. So for example, if I want these to have a different font, if they go out of that range, I can double click on this actual token, go to font, and now I can see that I want to change the font based on whatever this value is. Um, let's add a classification. So if the value is between zero and 10, I don't want any changes. I want it to look exactly like everything else. So I'm gonna use my default font. Um, but if it doesn't fit into any of the ranges, let's make it a custom font and we'll make it black, dark. Um, let's make it red and maybe a little bit bigger. Okay, so if it's between zero and 10, it's gonna look fine. If it's anything greater than 10, it's or outside of that particular range, it's gonna look like this. We'll hit okay. And you can see now that uh oh, did I do my thing? Let's check my default. It doesn't fit. Oh, I used the wrong, I used the wrong ranges. So it was in the wrong one. So let's do 95 and 105. So there's our acceptable range for this token, not for this one. Okay, so we can see that we're 98% and we look fine. 
But if we increase this and make it go outside of this range, so not only does our classifier token say out of range, but we also have a bright red font and it's bringing it to our attention. Okay. So other conditional formatting, like turning things on and off, we can do that in our batch actions. So again, you see here, we've got all of these actions um, that need to happen differently depending on who is logged in. So when the tech is log in, logged in, they're the only ones that are gonna be able to do the actions in this folder. When our reviewer logs in, we want these actions to happen. And then when our pathologist log logs in, we want these actions to happen. Now, if we double click into our folders, you can see that our running options window pops up. And here's where we've set the classifiers for when these batch actions are gonna be available. So for this particular action, we want the tech only group to be logged in. We want the document to be signed. So the flow tech status needs to be signed. And we don't want the second reviewer or the pathologist to have signed. When these tokens are true, then the checkbox will appear here. And so that's why right now our checkbox is not here because Robin hasn't signed off on this yet. But if she goes and electronically signs it, you'll see now that a checkbox has appeared because it's met the criteria for those batch actions to happen. So you can use that technique in order to set up your workflow so that these batch actions can only happen um, when certain things have happened in your layout, okay? Um, so I also wanna show you canned comments. So if you find that somebody is adding a lot of preconceived text over and over again, um, this happens a lot when pathologists are doing interpretations where they're constantly kind of coming in and for their interps they're saying something is normal when it's not or um, when it's normal all the time so that way they're not having to come in here in handwriting uh, you know results are normal um, to keep them from having to type that over and over again they can go up to view and see canned comments and you can build these comments directly in the window so if a sample, for example, if a sample is normal, um, we can have the canned text, TB and K populations are all present and within normal limits. Um, the nice thing about this is that you can also add tokens to this as well. Um, if you are constantly reporting out a lymph percentage, for example, we could add here and say um, lymph gated cells are 19.36% and you can grab this token, <clears throat> insert it into your canned comment, and now it becomes something that you can drag and drop anywhere you want in your layout. So if your pathologist is coming in, they look at this and they go, okay, everything's normal. I wanna say this is normal. I'm gonna drag that in here. I also wanna report on the lymphs. So I can drag that in here as well. You'll see that that token shows up. And again, that token will update in real time. So that way it's just saving you from having to type this stuff over and over. And over. Um, finally, I'd like to show you um, the alerts. So those are found in our quality tab. And um, we have this little section called alerts. Uh, if you click this, you'll see a list of all the alerts that we've created. And so this is basically the ability to bring your attention to a particular statistic um, and then giving you an alert message. So we can list everything we wanna check out in our layout before we, we run our actions or before we sign off on it. Um, and if it's outside of a limit that we've set, it's gonna kind of tell us what to do or it's gonna give us a message, right? So for the percent T limb sum, again, we wanted that to be less than 10. So we've set it so that if this token is less than 10%, it's gonna tell us to review the data. We can add another one. So let's say we wanted to check the lymph sum. And we can, again, we can drag these tokens directly from our layout so we don't have to build them again. So if our lymph sum is less than 95, I'm going to say check gating. Okay. So you'll have a list of alerts here. And then at the end of your analysis, before you sign off on it, you can come up here and run alerts. And it will tell you if all of the alerts passed or not. If you have one that's outside of your range, and I think I did this. Oh, 
Let me check my alerts. I think. Yep, I did it. Let's see this box is. is greater than 95. We'll say check gating. And when I run the alert, if one of them is outside of the range, it will tell you which ones have passed, which ones have not, and it will tell you whatever the alert message is. So this is, can be really nice to, do, to use if, say, you're looking for um, restricted B cells in an immunophenotyping analysis. Um, you can have them check the kappa lambda ratio or whatever it is you want to bring to someone's attention before they finish their analysis. Okay. Close this. Okay, so finally at the end here, I just want to show you of some examples of QC templates that um, you can use in your laboratory to be part of your quality management system. And so this is ways to use the software that isn't just for looking at patient data, right? So you can create and use QC templates for a variety of different tasks um, and integrate them in your quality management system. And so, you know, a quality management system is just a set of policies and processes that are designed to ensure high quality um, services in a laboratory. And having a well thought out QMS is not only a good idea to protect the integrity of patient results, um, but it's also required by most accrediting bodies for clinical laboratories. So if you're CAP or CLIA certified, um, they're gonna require you to have some sort of quality management system. And what you use for your quality management system is entirely up to you your lab and the type of testing you do, but it most often includes things like reagent lot checks, where you have to recheck new reagents against current reagents that are in use to make sure that, that there's no significant changes. Um, it can include qualitative and quantitative assessments, um, depending on um, what your criteria are in your lab for putting a reagent into clinical use. Um, and it can help you provide documentation for compliance. So, you know, a lot of times when you get um, you have a cap inspection, they're going to ask for documentation that you're doing lot checks, that things are um, working the way they're supposed to do, and your QC templates can help you do that. And so things like individual antibody lot checks and cocktail lot checks can be made a whole lot easier by doing all of that within FCC as well. Um, we can also create Levy Jennings charts directly within the software. So this is going to help you monitor precision of test reportables or precision of your instrument's performance over time. Um, these charts have built in West Guard rules um, and they, it forms the charts automatically for you and alerts you when there are points that are in and out. Um, so it just sort of makes it really easy to kind of see how things are going, you know, in a weekly or monthly fashion. Um, and then we have some layouts that are already created on our website that you could certainly use as a, as a starter layout for validating in your own clinical lab. So for things like linearity, um, if you're using Spiritech beads to do your linearity checks, um, we do have layouts on our website <clears throat> that are already built that you can get started with those. Or if you're doing antibody titrations, particularly as part of your lot checks, if you do a lot check and you see that something needs to be titered, um, we have those that layout on our website um, that you can download and certainly use it to start um, that process in your lab um, and validate it for your own usage. Okay, so let's look at a couple examples of those layouts. So you can kind of see what these look like. I'm going to go ahead and open the software. Okay. So here's an example of a lot to lot layout. We've got our old lot and our new lot. And you can see that we've got some qualitative or quantitative data here. Um, this is where we've used the if then else um, statements in our custom tokens. So in order for this, this lot check to pass, the MFI difference between the new and the old must be less than half a log dimmer. Um, and the difference between the positive populations has to be less than 10%. So you can see that our difference is 1.4% and that's a pass. Um, the difference between the median is less than half a log and that's a pass. And because both of these pass, the whole entire thing passes. Okay, and you can see, if we go to our formula, here's our big if then else token where we have um, kind of built these on top of each other to make sure all of the criteria pass um, before the lot check passes. And then you could certainly add batch actions to this to um, save this for documentation purposes, okay? Here's an example of our cocktail check template. 
Um, this is certainly something that you could build depending on, you could build in whatever criteria you want. So for example, this is if you are making cocktails in your lab and once the cocktail is made, you wanna do a comparison of those checks. So here we have the new cocktail, we have or the old lot cocktail, the new lot cocktail. Um, and then these markers are all things that must be checked in order for the QC to pass. Here we're looking at the comparisons between the two, all of the different patterns. So we're doing a qualitative check. We're checking to make sure all the markers are present in each tube. We're checking to make sure the patterns are consistent and appropriate for the specimen and the cell type that are used. Yes, the patterns match between the new lot and the old lot. Yes, but then we're also doing a quantitative um, check to make sure that the percent difference is within 5% of the old and the current lot. And we can see here that all of these are passing. So once all of our boxes are checked, you'll see that now our QC passes and we can sign off on this. Um, here we're also keeping track of our lots, lots, um, of our lot, sorry, our lot numbers. Um, and that will allow us to come back at any time and see what lots of antibodies were part of our cocktails. Okay. And I will show one more at the end here. So here is, we're gonna go back to our TB and NK layout. Um, and here I've taken this, this layout and I've kind of converted it to a monthly QC layout. Um, and so we have our basic gating strategy for our TB and NK populations. This is exactly like what we're reporting out for our patients. But on our second page, you can see that we've added Levy Jennings charts. Um, these charts can be inserted very easily by going to insert and under other, you'll see Levy Jennings. And you'll see they all pull information from the spreadsheet that we have inserted into our layout. The y-axis is all of the different reportables that we wanna look at over time. And if you can imagine that this might be, this, we've only got nine data points here, but if we had a month's worth of data, you can see the Levy Jennings chart looking at over time. Our lines are our West card rules. So if I click on this plot, go to overlays, you can see here that we can choose which West Guard rules we want to determine. We can choose the color of the lines. You can see here we have one, the mean, we have one SD, two SD, and three SD of the data. Um, if we had any points that were out, they would show up as red, and then you could certainly put something on here um, in order to make comments um, and then sign off on this and electronically sign it if you want as a way to document that you're monitoring changes over time. All right, so we've come to the end here. Um, it's a lot of information to, to go through in an hour. Um, so I do have some additional resources here. So if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and put them in the box. Um, I'd be happy to answer those or show you anything additional in the software. Um, you can also email us at support at denovosoftware.com. So if you have questions about a feature, um, if I zip through it too fast for you to see how to actually do it, or if you just would like to consult with us on how to add some of these features to your layout, um, how to incorporate them in a way that's most efficient, that's gonna help you, um, feel free to do that. Um, our TAS group is amazing um, and they're available um, to answer your questions, um, certainly within 24 hours and usually just within a few hours, okay? You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel for any updates for any videos or webinars. This webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in a few days. Um, we also have all of our past webinars, um, and, I'm, and then we've got webinars for a lot of these features that I talked about today that kind of goes into more in depth and how to use them and how to insert them into your layouts. Um, we're also adding a new Ask an Expert um, videos for our, um, for our customers. So this is where we will actually be going live on YouTube periodically to answer questions for um, any of our customers. So if you get stumped with something or you just wanna you know, come on our live with us and ask us questions on how to do things, please, please do that. Um, we're always looking for things to talk about um, for Ask an Expert. Um, if you haven't, if you're not using FCS Express 7 right now, maybe you're using 6 or you just haven't used the software at all and you wanna try out version 7, we do have a free fully functional 30 day demo available on our website. It does include all of the clinical features. Um, so you can try those out. Um, if you're interested in an IQ OQ sample or you want to demo those security and logging features, email us at support and we can set that up for you. Um, 
And then definitely check out our website for more information about clinical features that are in FCS Express IVD. Um, so if you go to our website, um, search for clinical, it'll pop right up and it'll kind of give you more overview and more information about a lot of the things I talked about today. Okay, with that, thank you again for joining us. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the box. Be happy to get those answered for you. Also, if you have other questions, again, you can email us at support, and we'd be happy to answer those for them, them for you there as well.